The Christmas Gift Mart is a community development initiative where every Christmas, Community Cares provides the opportunity for parents in low-income neighborhoods to purchase toys at $2 a piece. All the toys are donated. That allows us to use these $2 donations to provide funding back into the local schools. The most exciting thing about Gift Mart is seeing the families, the smiles on their faces, and seeing them have the opportunity to shop and leave with dignity because they were able to choose the toy that they know their kids are going to love. A great way to get involved with Gift Mart is by donating toys. We have to buy thousands and thousands of toys to meet the need, and we do that through actual physical toy donations. But you can also shop via our Amazon wishlist and have your toy donations shipped directly to us 
or you can donate financially and we'll do the shopping for you. Another great way to get involved is by volunteering your time. In addition to serving on the Gift Mart Day, we have opportunities leading up to the event where we sort and pack toys, deliver toy drive boxes, and go into the businesses that have held toy drives and bring the toys back. I've helped out for the last two or three years, and I've gone to both the Gift Mart and the um, packing. Tons of presents are coming in from all sorts of locations. Everything converges together, and things need to be sorted to head out to the different schools. Kind of a good opportunity to interact with uh, my children, getting kind of all the, like, the food and kind of the hot chocolate set up. When people are waiting in line, it's fun to give them hot chocolate and snacks and chips and stuff to keep them warm. I think it's really nice to be involved in Gift Mart and to give back uh, to the people around you and to the community. If you've ever participated in Gift Mart, we want to sincerely thank you because you've made the difference in thousands of families' lives. And I'd also challenge you to challenge yourself and to do a little bit more than maybe you've done in the past for Gift Mart so that we can make sure that every year, Gift Mart is the best that it can be. What an amazing legacy we're building together with Gift Mart. If you would like to be involved, text TOY to 331-226-1686 to get our Amazon wish list. Or you can give a financial donation at communityonline.info. Welcome to Community Online. Our mission is helping people find their way back to God. By joining us today, you've already taken your first step, and we would love to help you take your next steps with God, the church, and in the world. If you are new to Community Online, a special welcome to you. We would love to learn your name and get to know you. Just create your account at communityonline.tv so we can connect with you this week to help you take your next step. If you've already created your account, go ahead and log in so we know who's celebrating with us today. And feel free to say hi in the chat or request prayer. We're an online community that's for one another, so don't hesitate to reach out. Today, we will be starting a new series, our Christmas series called Making Room in Advent. I love this time of year because at Christmas, we celebrate the greatest gift ever given. The gospel writer John describes it this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's God's generosity that opened up the door for us to experience eternal life, life and life to the full, what we here at Community call the U plus life. It's a quality of life that we can begin living right now as we grow in our connection with God, others in the church, and together making an impact on the world. Part of that impact comes when we respond to God's generosity by being generous in return. That's why each week we take time in our service to give back to God. It's our generosity during this moment that makes everything God is doing in and through our church possible. Our giving honors God and demonstrates our commitment to partner with Him in His mission in this world. So join me right now in giving back to God. You can give and set up your recurring gift by going to givenow.cc or by texting the word GIVE to 331-226-1686. In a few moments, our lead pastor, Dave Ferguson, is going to bring us the first message in our Making Room in Advent series. Advent means coming or arrival. It's a season of transition between what is and what will be. It's meant to be a season to experience waiting. So before we hear from Dave, let's take a moment to settle our hearts and minds. Let's still ourselves before God and wait on Him. I don't like waiting. I hate waiting in traffic. I hate waiting for anything to download. 
I hate waiting on a response to an important text. I hate waiting for my coffee to cool so I can get that first sip in the morning. I, I just generally hate waiting. Now, this morning, I'm talking to all of our community expressions, to all our Chicagoland locations, uh, to those joining us via, via community online, to those joining us through community freedom, and also all of our 3C communities and micro churches. Now, in total, that's probably five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people, somewhere in there. And I doubt there's even one of us who just loves a good, long wait. So I'm pretty sure I'm in good company. We all hate to wait. But I'll tell you, some of the worst waiting for me comes this time of year. It comes specifically on Thanksgiving Day, and my dad is the perpetrator. And I'm pretty sure, Dad, you're watching, so I'm calling you out right now. Sorry about that, but I got to do it. Here's what often happens on Thanksgiving at the Elder Ferguson house. My mom and others have carefully crafted everyone's favorite meal of the year, and they placed it before us on the dining room table. Now, I just want you to kind of picture this, okay? There's a golden brown, piping hot Thanksgiving turkey. My favorite cornbread dressing. I'm not a stuffing guy at all. I'm all about the cornbread dressing. Hot off the stove mashed potatoes with butter melting in all the crevices. Oven fresh homemade crescent rolls, still steaming hot. Now I could go on and on, but it's just kind of making my mouth water right now. Now all of this has been perfectly timed to eat while it's still warm and delicious. So we all sit down and pray, then to eat. And right as we're getting started to pass the food, my dad interrupts and he'll say, you know, since it's Thanksgiving, I thought it would be a good idea if we just paused. And we took some time and go around the table and have each of us say something we're grateful for. <laughs> now, I mean, you know you can't say anything, right? I mean, how, how do you protest expressing gratitude on Thanksgiving? But on the inside, I'm thinking, you know what? I'll be grateful when this wait is over and I can stuff my pie hole. <laughs> I hate waiting. But let me ask you this. What if waiting had a purpose? What if waiting to find Mr. Right or Miss Right had a purpose? What if waiting on a dream to be realized and fulfilled had a purpose? What if waiting on that opportunity you were promised had a purpose? What if waiting on the pain that you're experiencing to end had a purpose? What if your waiting, the waiting you're experiencing today, had a bigger purpose? What if we discovered that while we all, we do, we hate to wait, that in waiting, we can actually make room for God and that God does some of his best work in us and through us while we're waiting. Now, a little bit, I'm gonna share with you three ways that God can work in our waiting. So stick with me. And that's just one of the reasons I'm so excited about our new series, Making Room in Advent. Now, you see, this word Advent means coming. And Advent is meant to be four weeks of waiting in preparation for the coming of Christmas. The intention behind Advent is for it to be a season to, of exper to experience purposeful waiting. Now, historically, this was a time where Christians would fast and wait in anticipation of the Messiah's coming. And yet, what most of us experience during Advent, rather than purposeful waiting, is a lot of impatient, frantic chaos. It doesn't have to be that way. As a Christmas gift to you during this series, we are partnering with artist Betty Dickinson, whose paintings and reflections on some of the characters in the Christmas story will help us make room in Advent. Here's Betty to introduce us to the first character in the story of Advent. Zechariah the priest and his wife Elizabeth were model Israelites. According to the text, they were righteous in the sight of God. Yet they had a problem. They were both old and barren. Barrenness in their particular culture would have been a cultural stigma. It was often interpreted as a sign of God's judgment, which looks pretty bad for a priest. Yet when Zechariah was old, he came upon a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He was chosen by Lot to go into the temple to burn incense, a sign of the prayers of the people of Israel. It's almost as if Luke sets up a parallel here between Zechariah and the people of Israel. Because the people of Israel had been barren and waiting too. They had been waiting for their promised Messiah, 
And for 400 years, they had no word from the Lord, only silence. So Zechariah goes into the temple to burn incense. And the people of Israel are gathered to pray outside as Zechariah went in. You can feel the tension rising here in the story, right? They had done this how many times with other priests and had no response from God? Yet this time, an angel appears to the right of the altar. Zechariah is caught completely off guard and gripped with fear. But the angel says, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. The angel Gabriel makes this incredible promise about who John the Baptist would be how he would go before the Lord and prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And Zechariah's response, he says, how can I be sure of this? I can only imagine what it must have been like for Zechariah to wait and pray for decades for a son. His very name means Jehovah has remembered. But had God forgotten? Zechariah and Elizabeth must have cried out countless sleepless nights for God to answer their prayers. And yet here he is, an old man, childless and full of shame, waiting in silence. This barrenness, this waiting, was not Zechariah and Elizabeth's fault. They had done everything right in the sight of God. I ache with them here. I know what it feels like to say all the right prayers and do all the right things, but encounter God's silence in the face of my longings. Have you ever felt that way? It's no wonder that when the angels spoke to him, Zechariah had questions. Zechariah and Elizabeth had been waiting and waiting and waiting. For decades, they waited for a child and they did all the right things. And yet Elizabeth and Zechariah were still waiting on God to answer their prayer. It seemed everything God had promised wasn't happening. And as the wait went on, Zechariah is running out of hope. I mean, look at the scene in Luke chapter one. An angel miraculously shows up, all right? Don't let that casually pass you by, an angel. An angel shows up and tells him, God has heard your prayers. Elizabeth is going to have a child. Now look at Zechariah's skeptical response. It says there, it says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Did you catch that? He's asking an angel, how can I be sure of this? I mean, Zechariah has all but given up. Now, we also need to stop here for just a second. This is for all of you husbands out there. I want you to take note. Zechariah says, did you catch this? I am an old man, and my wife is, well, along in years. <laughs> I mean, he may not have any kids, but this guy's been successfully married for a long time. He is a smart, smart man. This has nothing to do with our big idea, but it's something I thought you guys could learn from, all right? Now, Zechariah's struggle it's one that we can all relate to. Because it's hard to pray heartfelt prayers and feel like all you're getting back from God is silence. It's painful to be confronted over and over again with unmet longings and unrealized dreams. And many times in the waiting, we are tempted to lose hope and just give up. And that's exactly where Elizabeth and Zechariah were. And my hunch is that many of you are to today. You know how this feels. Soon I know a little bit about what it's like uh, for Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, not long after we got married, we decided we wanted to start a family. And I remember just how excited we both were when Sue showed me her positive pregnancy test and we were gonna have a kid. Then we went to the doctor for the ultrasound to see the first glimpse of our baby. Well, uh, the baby, for reasons we didn't fully understand, had stopped developing. And so the dream of being parents and of having a baby would have to wait. There's almost nothing we like about waiting. Waiting's hard, and waiting often feels very painful. But then again, what if there was a purpose in our waiting? What if waiting gives God an opportunity to work in our lives in ways that we need. Pastor and author Rich Lotus wrote something that's just, it's stuck with me and I hope it'll stick with you. He wrote this, he says, what God does in us as we wait is often more important than what we're waiting for. 
Let, let that sink in. What God does in us as we wait is often more important than what we're waiting for. Do you think that could be true? See, often we don't see any benefit in waiting. But what if waiting is actually the thing that makes room for God to work? And for me, the more I've delved into this topic of waiting, the more I'm convinced that waiting can serve a purpose. And I want us to talk about three ways that God can work in our waiting. Well, well, first, in our waiting, God teaches us to trust him. He teaches us to trust him. Now, our culture tends to really, I mean, we celebrate self-reliance. And self-reliance can be a good trait. But self-reliance can also get in the way of trusting God. Now, for me, by nature, I mean, I'm a type A personality. I, I want to make stuff happen. I have a bias for action, you know, goal and accomplishment. But the shadow side of all that is that sometimes I become too self-reliant. I end up trusting myself more than I trust God. And when that happens, I miss out on the God-sized things he's trying to do because I'm relying on myself to accomplish, you know, Dave-sized things. And sometimes trusting God means to trust in God's timing. And let's be honest, God's timing doesn't always make sense to us, right? Often it contradicts what we think we should be doing and what should be happening. And in those instances, it's so crucial that we not waste our waiting. Let me say that again, that we not waste our waiting, but we use it to grow in our trust in God. In Zechariah and Elizabeth's story, I'm sure their preference, their preference would have been to have a child in their younger years and not wait until they were so old. But God's timing meant that they would get to experience the incredible joy, the incredible privilege of raising a son in John the Baptist who would literally go on to prepare the way for Jesus. See, in our waiting, we need to make room for God to teach us to trust him. There's a second purpose for our waiting. In our waiting, God also matures us. He matures us and grows us up. Now, let me ask you this. What happens when a toddler doesn't get what they want when they want it? They throw a fit, right? In public, in a store, in church, they don't care. They aren't mature. They want it now. They don't want to wait. As adults, waiting can bring out the immaturity in us too. I came across a story of one older couple who really, really hated waiting. In fact, they hated waiting so much, they sued the people that made them wait. The Prasads are now in their 60s. They're tired of waiting. With every year that passed, they got more and more frustrated waiting for their first grandchild. <laughs> so the Prasads resorted to a desperate desperate tactic to force their son and daughter-in-law to give them a grandkid. They decided to sue them. Specifically, they sued their son. I'm not making this up. True story, okay? The Versailles hired a legal representative who took their son to court, and then he began to explain to the judge. He said, Mr. and Mrs. Versailles have raised their son, paid for his full education, which was expensive, to the point where he's now an employed pilot. The attorney went on and said, they see other people in the neighborhood playing with grandchildren, and they feel like they should not have to wait any longer. And the legal counsel then concluded, so the Prasads are suing their son in the amount of $643,000 if, in the next year, he does not give them a grandchild. I mean, you really can't make this stuff up. And I told you, people hate to wait. And it can also cause us to respond very immaturely. But at the same time, think about this, okay? Think about this. When have you experienced the greatest amount of growth in your relationship with Jesus? I bet when you look back, it's been moments of waiting and challenge. I mean, when our lives are running smoothly, we tend not to grow or develop our faith nearly as much as when we're waiting and being challenged. I know it's true for me. I remember as a young pastor starting this church, I mean, I had to wait on any kind of financial security. All the while, continue to tithe, you know, that means 10%, and be generous. Doing that, and during that, what it did is it grew me up and it matured me. During the waiting, whatever it is you're waiting for, God wants to mature you. The prophet Isaiah writes this, he says, but those who wait in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
Now, now some translations actually say those who hope on the Lord. And what you have is this wonderful promise that when we have hope in the middle of waiting, God gives us strength. It's in our times of waiting that God matures us. So, so first, in our waiting, God teaches us to trust him. Second, in our waiting, God matures us. But finally, in our waiting, God is at work. God's at work. And it may feel like to you, nothing is happening. I get it. But make no doubt about it, okay? During times of waiting, God is at work. Well, let's, let's go back to our story. When Zechariah has his encounter with the angel, he struggles to believe that God's really at work. In fact, the angel Gabriel causes Zechariah to go mute because of his failure to believe. Now, I don't think this was so much a punishment as it was an opportunity for Zechariah to be silent, to wait, and quietly see how God was at work. Zechariah finishes the responsibilities at the temple, and then he goes home. And shortly after, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. God was at work. And then the day comes. Zechariah and Elizabeth had waited and endured times of sadness, frustration, despair, but now they were holding this newborn baby boy, right? God was at work. Their neighbors and relatives asked Zechariah what he, what he wanted to name the boy, and he motioned for them to bring a writing tablet. And on it he wrote, his name is John. And then Luke tells us what happens next in the story. It says, immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. This child that they now held would not only change their lives, but would impact the entire nation of Israel. I mean, God was clearly at work. And not only would that child impact the nation of Israel, but we'd also be the one to prepare the way for the coming Messiah, Jesus. God was at work. God used an unlikely couple to have an unlikely baby to prepare the way for Jesus. In their waiting, God was at work. And even if we don't see it or understand it, in our times of waiting, know this, God is at work. And if you're in a season of waiting, hear me. This is an important season in your life. Don't waste your waiting. Remember what Rich Flotus, I love this. What God does in us as we wait is often more important than what we're waiting for. Advent is meant to be a season of waiting, a season where we make room for God by waiting with a purpose. I want to learn how to do that. This waiting with a purpose. I want you to learn how to do that. I, I want our whole church to learn this important lesson of how do we, because so much of life is this, waiting with a purpose. So what are you waiting for? You might be waiting for an answer to prayer. You might be waiting on love. I mean, to be loved or to give love. You might be like Elizabeth and Zechariah. You're waiting to start a family. You might be waiting on some direction vocationally. You might be waiting on a breakthrough financially. You might be waiting on a healing physically. Making room in Advent is an invitation away from the chaos of a commercialized Christmas and into a space where God is at work just like he was during that first Advent season. And right now, I wanna prepare us to take communion together. I encourage you to grab something to eat like a piece of bread or a cracker and something to drink like juice or water so you can join us in that moment. As we prepare for communion, I want you to take a moment to reflect, to breathe, and to think about what you want this Advent season. I wanna ask you to close your eyes and let's focus on making room in our hearts for Jesus. Maybe this is an Advent where in your waiting, you need to be reminded that God hasn't forgotten about you or the plans he has for you. You can trust him. Or maybe this is an Advent when you need to know that he's using your present circumstances to grow you up spiritually, to mature you. 
Or maybe this is an advent where you need to surrender to God and let Him be God. He wants you to believe that He is at work, even when you don't see it. How do you want to make room for Jesus during this Advent season? Let's make room for God in this season of waiting.
As we enter into this Advent season, let's make room for God to do whatever He wants to do in us and through us. Let's look to Jesus with anticipation in this time of waiting as we receive the bread, His body broken for us. And the cup, His blood shed for us. Will you pray with me? Creator God, thank you so much for the gift of your Son. Prepare our hearts during this season of waiting. By the power of your Holy Spirit, fill us with hope. Comfort us, and thank you for being with us in all our waiting. It's in your Son's name that I pray. Amen. I'm so glad you were with us today. And as we enter this season of Advent, this season of waiting, let me remind you of the truth that Dave shared with us today. In the waiting, God teaches us to trust Him. In the waiting, God matures us. In the waiting, God is at work. Advent is meant to be a season of waiting, a season when we make room for God's promises by waiting with hope. I hope you've been encouraged today to open your heart, your mind, your very life to Him. Before I let you go, I have two exciting things to share with you. First, Kids City has a wonderful resource for you to use with your kids this Advent season. It's an Advent calendar for families. You can find it and download it at communityonline.info or scan the QR code here. Also, as you probably know, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving has become known as Giving Tuesday, and I'm excited to share that community will be participating in Giving Tuesday this year. In fact, every gift given to community on Tuesday, November 29th, will be matched by generous leaders from community up to $100,000. Stay tuned to our social media feeds and your email to find out more and to participate in Giving Tuesday. I'm so glad you're able to start this Advent season with us here at Community. I hope to see you right back here next week for Community Online.